welcome the panel to our discussion of problematizing the profession. This is something of a historic moment. We don't want to sound like we're uh, involved in something funereal. It's look, we're very much looking to, we're, the, black. to <laughs> we're very much looking to the to the future here. But the, the, the moment of bringing together Matrix, Muff, and Parlor from a feminist perspective is something of a landmark. I don't think it's ever happened before, has it? Um, I thought I would... <laughs> they're, they're, they're in denial, if it has. We had a lovely... We had a lovely... We were actually last week. We were in Melbourne. Huh? I'm sorry, Lynn. We were all in Melbourne last week. But we haven't all been together in this space. No, we haven't here at the AA together. How about, in, how about at the before. AA in London? We'll yeah, so we've never, we've never uh, met. No. Well, well, we all love Joss. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just start out by introducing this rather lively group. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sort of having to uh, say that they're, they're on their own. I, I, when, I, when I emailed them to tell them what the panel was going to be about and how it was going to be structured, they all emailed back saying, no, that's not the way it's going to happen. Yeah. So they have designed this, this uh, panel and, I'm, and it's all the better for it too, I must say. <laughs> Let me just start out by saying that we have uh, representatives from Matrix, Muff, and Parlor, uh, uh, and just go around. And Julia can kind of uh, so you're you're known. Julia, I, I, I'm not going to read your entire wonderful biography. Everyone has that in their pack. But just to say that uh, she is an Aussie who studied architecture there and in the UK including a time here at the AA. And she, if, if you look in the back of, of the book that we've written about women in architecture at the AA, you'll see quite a few uh, references to one uh, Jay Dwyer, who uh, is, is a very articulate person as well as, as, as a, a brilliant uh, designer who's concerned about these connections between architecture and society, which links her research and practice. So that's Julia. I, when we think of, of Matrix, it's impossible for those of us who, who know the members of Matrix and who are members of the sort of larger architectural community to not think of Sue Francis, who was uh, uh, one of the sort of strongest thinkers, most, most creative thinkers that, that I know about the issues uh, that, that we're concerned with here today, about the connections between art and society, for example, about participatory design. And Sue died uh, earlier this year, but we just want to take this moment to kind of remember her and remember how important she was, not only to Matrix, but to AAXX100, and uh, uh, how she continued to support us throughout her, her illness. So uh, a, a thought for Sue, or many thoughts for Sue, actually. The other Matrix person who's sitting closest to you and who you've heard in, in the debate earlier is Joss Boyce. Joss uh, trained at the Bartlett, and she has been involved in community-based practice, research and teaching since then. And she's uh, last appeared here, now I'm gonna be corrected again probably, but she last appeared here at the AA talking about uh, disability and design, which is one of her, her current interests. So that's, that's uh, Joss. Liza Fior of Muff. I think the best thing to, the way to describe uh, Liza is, uh, is to say that uh, she will describe herself. <laughs> but the, my favorite Liza story, which she told me, and which is, I think, in her, her uh, uh, bio, is that Muff really emerged from the AA. Uh, she met Catherine Clark while she was teaching at the AA, and they, with Julia Bidgood and Kath uh, Schofield, uh, took advantage of the Unit 8 room here in the AA on Saturdays to begin working together, which was really the beginning of Muff, which she's going to be talking about today. So it's really in conversation with each other and with other students, which, as she put it, provided the ballast which came afterwards. Uh, Justine, who's looking at me in a uh, very serious way, 
She's the architect, is an architectural editor. Uh, she's perhaps best known to those of you in the room through the, the website, the parlor website, which is uh, a fantastic platform, which I'm sure she and indeed um, uh, her colleague will be talking about uh, in a few minutes. But she has a very distinguished uh, life outside of Parler and uh, is former editor, for example, of Architecture Australia, which is the journal of record for Australian architecture. And finally, uh, Karen, Karen Burns, who um, uh, many of you know her work. She's uh, an architectural historian. She's talked uh, about her fantastic project uh, with uh, Laurie, uh, the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia, which is in, in the process of production, contract signed, we understand, very good. But she's a writer and has written widely on uh, women, feminism, and architecture. So uh, that's really the intros. Um, I thought I would just say a few words about what we're what I think is the kind of baseline as, as a historian for what we're talking about. When you're talking about problematizing the profession, what is the profession that you're problematizing? And on the screen here, you see a, a photograph of two young AA graduates and architects who are um, undoubtedly delighted with being in the profession. They have all the accoutrements, and I don't know if Georgina is here, they even have a brush which is, I've been told, the key item for getting rid of all those uh, uh, scrapings out that people had to do when they were making their designs uh, uh, in, in, in the old-fashioned way. But here, here at the AA, since 1917, women students were taught mainly by male architect tutors on the same course as male students. So it's not surprising that they sort of practiced in, in that, on that model the women students were given a systematic architectural education, encouraged to professionalize, to get a diploma, to pass the RIBA exams, join the institute, and after 1921, the AA. They aspired to professional practice. They did not challenge the professional structures. They wanted to participate in them. And as this photograph indicates, for many, it was a thrilling journey, an exciting journey. Um, they set up on their own, they put their names in the practice, they built up a client list, the bigger the better, and they promoted their work, taking care that it was published and promoted in the building press. And these were aims of men and women of the profession alike. Now, what we've heard uh, uh, and will hear this evening, and in some instances is in the exhibition and in the book, are the sort of threads of feminism that runs throughout practice over the last 100 years. But we'll let that develop out of our conversation uh, this evening. So uh, could I invite the, the first speakers, uh, speaker to, to come up and... Yeah, we're gonna do it in relay. Uh, uh, yeah, as you wish. <laughs> See, I, te I tell you, they tell me what to do. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, I'm happy, happy with that. Cool. Uh, so the order we're going in is chronological from uh, when each of these uh, attempts at thinking through architecture more widely and differently have happened. Um, so that's why Matrix is going first. Down? Down? down. 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 Uh, Lights down. down? So I want to take you back to 1979. Some of you will have been there also. Um, and some of you won't. Uh, what we know is now called Second Wave Feminism. And uh, for those of us coming through studying uh, architecture, there were lots of different um, things going on in the world of wide world, which meant uh, that the things, the, the, there was a kind of a recognition really about some of the problems both within the profession and within society. And the thing that was interesting for us, I think, working as, as students really, coming through places like the AA, the Bartlett, many other schools, um, was trying to pin down what that problem was. It's something Becky Friedman called the problem with no name. It was like there was something that was difficult, and particularly uh, difficult for women, 
And we didn't really know what it was. We didn't really know how to pin it down. And as a group of us got together, um, and again, it was a part of a wider political thing. There was something called the New Architecture Movement, which was a, um, a political movement for unionisation of architecture, uh, of architectural workers. Um, it became increasingly clear that it was, it was that stereotype. You know, the women were still all making the tea for the men. And so a group of us got together, which was called for Bit Women's Design Collective, and there was actually huge, uh, you know, 80, 90 women in the room at one time, uh, having arguments, actually, about whether you worked within the profession or outside of it. <laughs> <laughs> a big argument. And, um, and we looked for what we could find that might help us deal with this issue. What? Because, you know, our tutors told us, and the world told us, that architecture is just a neutral thing. The building around doesn't do anything. It just is. It's functional. And there's no problem. Um, and we looked to, uh, most importantly, really, um, American historians like Dolores Hayden and uh, Gwendolyn Knight. We looked to particularly uh, a really burgeoning movement in geography, feminist geographers, uh, people like Doreen Massey. So we found stuff elsewhere. We certainly didn't find it within architecture. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. We were kind of grappling. The word sexism didn't exist. We were grappling with this kind of... Um, uh, we just trying to be able to say things. We, weren't even know, we didn't know what they were in 79. And out of that came um, the NAM Feminist Group, Women's Design Service, and out of that came the Matrix Book Group. I wanted to show this version of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody stole me. I don't, well, of course, I can't tell you what architecture school got stolen from. Because that probably <laughs> did it. But, um, because that's the state of the book now. 1984, it was published. It's been handled by a huge number of people, and I get emails, and we all get emails regularly <laughs> for people asking us um, for information about Matrix, and uh, that's to show you how many people took it out. I mean, from my point of view, maybe this architecture school, which is now obvious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Barbara. Could have, could have, you know, got some more copies, but there we go. What we have is this beautiful, beautiful kind of remnant uh, of a book that's currently out of print and which we have every intention of getting back into print. If you want to pay 150 quid, you can, you're welcome to buy a copy. Um, and, and then I just wanted, I'm not even going to talk about what was in the book, um, but we can talk about that more generally if required. But I wanted to talk about the kind of waves that came out of it because I think obviously Julie will talk about the architecture practice, but it was a moment, and particularly in Mon London, there was a moment where um, opportunities arose, there were um, left-wing uh, filmmakers, mm. uh, there were opportunities to put stuff on Channel 4, which was trying to put new kinds of programmes out. So, for example, um, and this is a, my dad made a video of the TV for me, which is really yeah. sweet thing, because he thought it was, he was like, no idea what I was doing, um, <laughs> which is called Paradise Circus, and which has lots of interviews with, it's about women in the city in in Birmingham, which uh, talked to a lot of women involved in that period in different feminist activities and activism, of which Matrix was one. And this picture up here is Anne Thorne, who went on to run her own practice, still runs her own practice, um, uh, talking to the client of Jaganari, which was one of the key buildings that they did in that period. And finally, just because I wanted to um, mention something about impact, and it is, it's like when you're trying to pin down how it is that space is in somehow gender and how you can talk about it, and I think there's lots of things that we didn't get right, but we were trying to explain something about that. Um, it's really nice to see, and again it's a moment, this is 88. Uh, this is, this is one of those boring male telegraph, you know, colonel type figures writing. Uh, but he's saying, this was a really good programme. The women were actually really sensible about the city that we designed. Some argument seems slightly confusing and convincing, but this did not distract from the conviction of the film. So it was kind of part, it, it kind of grew and grew, really, for a bit. And then um, uh, politics changed, all sorts of things made it much harder to operate <coughs> in the way that we were able to. Julia? Just in terms of simple historical fact, I think I, I wasn't really intending to talk about Matrix uh, as a kind of narrative about the practice in detail, because we've only three minutes. So, <laughs> um, 
so it very quickly, uh, so a book was written that Josh showed, and then some people decided to set up a practice. And it was absolutely brilliant he hearing uh, Andrea Merritt's discussion about uh, the, what was it called, the open practice? Was it the open, design. the open design office in Boston uh, that happened uh, in the period before Matrix began? Matrix began around the end of the 1970s where the Open Design Office was doing these very, very similar, asking very, very similar questions, like what would it be like if we set up a practice that was entirely women? What would we do? How would we make that practice work? And uh, we didn't know about them. I mean, it, it's just extraordinary. All we had, we had, as Joss said, we, we knew about feminist anthropologists, apparently. I didn't know about them, but the true founders of Matrix were three women, Sue Francis, Fran Bradshaw and Anne Thorne did, and they had actually a conference here called uh, Women in Space. Women in Space, and some people, of course, thought it was about astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> it was that period, uh, but it was actually in, in influenced by feminist uh, anthropologists who were doing that kind of work, the kind of work that we didn't have a name for, and also. Uh, as uh, Laurie said, volume 11 of Heresies, which was an American publication about women in architecture. And these are like, it's almost like Samistat. They were precious print medium things that we knew. We didn't know anything about Boston. We didn't know a lot. Um, so we embarked on exactly the same experiment just a few years after uh, the architects in Boston. Uh, and uh, I was just uh, using this talk as a time to reflect on what we did rather than go through all of the things that happened. Uh, and looking back over the uh, 12 to 15 years of Matrix's existence from about 1980 to sometime around 1992. And the things that uh, I was drawing out. And, and for this event, I decided that, or we decided that... Um, we would be interested in the tactics that were adopted given the conditions of the time that were mutating through that decade. Uh, and, they were, and, and they were feminist tactics. So the first was this idea of exemplary, which is not a self-congratulatory thing, although it's not a particularly great word, but it is a good word, because we were trying to provide an example more to ourselves than anybody else about how you made best practice. And you, you did it root and branch. You, you, you redesigned practice in every, on every level. Um, I've shown a few images of things that I just found, you know, in the bottom of a drawer, in the bottom of a box. Uh, uh, just uh, as, as, as a corollary to all of this, which is where are we going to put all this stuff later? And this has been a, a, sort of a running discussion in, in the conference so far. And that's a clip from Building Design. Building Design, um, the trade paper for, the, for, for architects in the UK, um, did a series on women in architecture, or on new practices, actually, women in architecture. And that's a very embryonic matrix in the uh, third image uh, to, uh, to your, to your uh, right. Um, we set up in someone's front room. Uh, and, of course, what we did was we formed a co-op, because that's what you did. We went and talked to an, uh, another embryonic architectural co-op, Kaysenove, and we found out from them how you made a co-op, and then we made a co-op. And then we did lots of other things. I, I don't know, I mean, lots of things, the sorts of things that the Boston women had, had experimented with that we didn't know about, like equal pay, relatively flexible working hours, not that flexible, but relatively... Uh, a really conscious practice around how we went to building sites. Um, uh, and I'll go on to talk about the way we work with clients. But um, we also felt it our duty to write to the paper when things came up. So there's an <laughs> example. But because we were an exemplary practice to ourselves and, and it became clear also to other people. So we needed to take on um, the many, many art uh, letters that came into building design, taking exception to this series on women in architecture. Why are women doing this? You know, why? There was a very long one that I haven't clipped here, which is about women really needed to pay attention to the next generation and not be architects, such thrusting architects. We didn't think we were very thrusting, but... And that was a woman. So, you know, we found... So we wrote that we... Uh, needed to, you know, 
address fundamental questions concerning the philosophy behind design. We must challenge those questions and all of those things. So thus spoke some very young people. Um, and we got on with it. Um, so just the first tactic was this notion of addressing practice root and branch. The next one is one aspect of that, I suppose, is we, we set out only to work for uh, publicly funded projects. Um, and so that's this notion of selectivity, who, what clients we address. We didn't do loft conversions. We didn't do private housing. We didn't borrow from the rich to pay for the poor that the Boston Collective did, so that's a difference. And there was a climate just about in London which allowed us to survive for a while doing that kind of work. So you see a social housing project there, Jaganari, which is a, a building uh, where the client was a group of Asian women who wanted a, a women-only space in, uh, in Whitechapel. Uh, a nursery building in Southwark for the council and a, sort of a statement of our, of our intent. So, and then uh, there was very, very much a notion of, in, of enabling. So uh, we, the, another difference with Boston was that we were able to get a lot of money, I guess, from the GLC, Greater London Council at the time, the Women's Committee, blessed soul, um, to enable a technical aid for women's groups or groups that benefited women. So we did many, many, many projects all in Greater London to help people to put in uh, applications for funding for building changes. And then uh, there was this thing about the word instructive. We, we were firstly always engaged in discussing what a building process was with our clients and, and doing classes around drawing with scale drawing, all kinds of tactics around involving people in the building process. And we also were aware of the legacy we needed to leave in the form of printed books once the Greater London Council, which was then led by Ken Livingstone, was, was closed down by Maggie Thatcher, well-known event. So we left a legacy in terms of printed material uh, as well. Um, and uh, we, the two big projects were uh, a guidebook, if you like, very unfashionable. We were, it was even unfashionable then, but we decided we needed to do it around building, buildings for the under fives and also a, a, a quite a, a, an extensive leaf at promoting a career in the whole, in building, in the built environment. So we covered all, we were very, very clear that architecture wasn't it, it was only one of many things, and then you could also be a woman builder or a surveyor or a, anything like that, but there needed to be more women in all those fields. So that's what we did. Um, and then uh, the next thing I'm reflecting on, I suppose, is, uh, oh, so that's wrong, okay. So is the tales, if you like, the, Lynn, the threads that Lynn mentions, which is, of course, a natural uh, word to use around the sorts of things. So the sorts of things that these kinds of very uh, ground up or root and branch sorts of experiments lead to. And I'm only going to just list very quickly the things that are directly, directly connected with Matrix, not the ripples, not the discussion, but the things that occur to me pretty quickly. So publications and polemics, um, you can't see the text there, but it's a series of demands by women um, academics for how to improve architectural education in architecture school. So that's a list of demands. I won't go through them now. There isn't time. They're pretty good, actually. They still apply, yeah. um, of course. Uh, networks and events. So a whole raft, a ripple of networks that all of us were involved with it to different degrees started to happen in the period after the end of Matrix in the 90s. Um, including some organisations like Women in Manual Trades. Uh, uh, Fran Bradshaw was a, a bricklayer and she was very much involved in Women in Manual Trades, Feminist Architects Network, Women Architects for Equal Representation, WAFO. Lynn remembers that. And that's a little crop. There's an illegible crop <coughs> there of a leaf that was given when people like Lynn uh, organised a, a meeting with the Labour MPs at the House of Parliament to discuss the inadequacy of the new design for parliamentarian officers that uh, Hopkins were, were working on at the time. Their incredible engagement with a, with a group of uh, politicians who were not yet in power. And so on. And uh, uh, contemporary organisations, groups like Taking Place, 
which is a group of academics and artists, some of whom are here, um, which has uh, carried on questioning form and content around issues to do with feminism, space, and so on, and all kinds of other groups, Architects for Health, uh, Association of Community Technical Aid Centres. New practices, I haven't listed linked practices, I've just listed practices people set up, and Thorn Architects, Women's Design Service, and then teaching some of the feminist practices, specifically the Women into Architecture and Building course that was set up by Yvonne Dean, who was at the AA, uh, and then taken on by Sue Francis, Lynn, Lynn Walker taught on it, and all kinds of other people. Um, and that got a whole generate, well, quite a few years of women uh, students into Lon what is now London Met, uh, going through that, going through those courses and changed completely the demographic of architecture students at that university, foundation course. Medical Architecture Research Unit, Sue Francis. Uh, evening train. Uh, evening classes, uh, women builders, we found that we couldn't get women builders to work on projects because they didn't know how to cost things and they didn't know about building regulations and so on, so we did classes for them. And then research, which is an ongoing sort of uh, fallout, if you like, a, or, or connect, a connected sorts of development since, uh, since Matrix. Um, thank you. Set the swap up. So um, first to say thank you, Lynn. And and um, thank you for the beautifully reproduced Muff's <laughs> first project, which I was already able to um, point out that this wasn't an unbuilt project, because perhaps one reason that Muff, one of the many reasons Muff hasn't managed to be um, a star architect, is that our very first project was a feasibility study <laughs> for the Museum of Women's Art. And so we worked hard on our feasibility study, and this is the model of our thinking. And after three months' work with um, the organisation who were setting up um, just around um, the first lottery funding, we came back with our conclusion, which was they didn't need a building. <laughs> and they shouldn't have a building, because to enclose women's art in another structure would be to perpetrate what had been going on historically. So, um, yeah, that, so it's all explained in the book. I'd also like to say, so I'm here representing Muff. Um, ironically enough and beautifully enough, uh, the studio, um, all 12 of them, are drawing um, because there's a deadline. <laughs> uh, we, but we have, do have here, we have Sarah Hershey, wave, hey. <laughs> uh, Mel Dodd, 97. <laughs> um, Helen Thomas and Elke Kreshny, who are in different ways um, members of the studio and, and, are, and collaborators. Um, so who isn't here? Juliet Biggood, who I'm glad to say we are collaborating again. And sadly, the late Kath Schonfield, who um, you know, made such fantastic work and writing. And so I think each moment, what's important is to think of the way the overlaps is not that each individual practice, and I think going back to the conference so far, the danger of the monograph is to assume this sort of contained, tidy organisation of history. But perhaps what is particular is the time which one works in. And so Muff was set up in, um, during Conservative government, there's no such thing as society, and there's also no such thing as funding for public <laughs> space. Um, we um, set, Muff was set up to make space to make work, and um, I personally was very clear, I was pregnant at the time, that I would never work again, and that was the last year that I worked, the last year of six years at the AA was the year my first child was born, but we were also making a space to explore the overlaps between art practice and architecture and conceptual art practice of questioning um, limits and, uh, and eccentrically enough, establishing like Matrix that we weren't going to do domestics, which is a word that describes both um, architectural commissions and, and murders. And so this is the... Um, this was our New Year card for this year of that idea that we are complicit. 
the projects are loaded. And if we're going to frame Muff's work within histories of feminism and think about intersectionality and privilege, and that I, I too had free school dinners, but I'm also in a place of privilege. And how do we, when we find ourselves in projects and complicit, establish where we make the compromises in order to make um, a contribution? Which, um, and, and we do it through unsolicited research, the work that isn't in the brief. We, um, just like Matrix, bring the tools that we have at our hands. Um, so this is not our drawing. This is the sort of compromise project the Muff finds ourselves in. So making the public realm framework for this study. And this was our first offering. So this is our drawing. And um, out of that came a complete dismantling of that uh, master plan, which now no longer exists. And a year later, offering something else up. Um, simply, good work requires an accuracy. But the danger is projects get bigger. Where do you find yourself you know, how can you make that Clifford gets deep hanging out if you're with the developer? And um, you are, as an agent of expensiveness in that privilege, you know, where, where do you expand the brief? And we simply do it by making sure that we always have a wedge in our pocket, <laughs> nice fruit wood, um, and stay in the room long enough. And I think that's how Muff have matured is we get getting sacked later in projects, um, unlike, say, the Dome. Stay there long enough to make use of that privilege. Um, and in doing so, begin to change the meaning of the situation and the brief. And so this is a nice little slide from 69. The creche is in the, in the director's office. And of course, all that means is, is the baby under the table, which reframes the desk as the playpen. Um, and to be really awake to the fact that we're now in year nine of austerity. So in 2008, I met a project manager on site to discuss a new park and she got a note on her Blackberry to say she'd lost her job. We went to the pub. Um, and since that, was, that was the beginning of austerity. And so all these... Um, the projects that we have in the studio are in different ways trying to create those create spaces, make things public. This is the, a drawing that's on the desk at the moment and it's simply a street. So going back to Matrix and the road and who's on the road here, widening the, the space, the pedestrian, squeezing the cars, introducing sustainable urban drainage so as to make the water sweet so that less fish die. Or um, wedging the door open to make invitations to those not invited. I'm, 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 I'm representing two people, so I'm still on time. I'm now moving into Julia's period. Um, but I'm going to stop before she does. I'm going to do like Julia's first slide. And so um, this was the invitation from the V&A was to take part in an uh, exhibition which they had named All This Belongs to You. We um, invited women for refugee women to test the edges, you know, push like in a, in a room in the dark, pushing the furniture till it falls over. And um, we had to uh, threaten to leave the project when we were told that the solidarity quilt couldn't come in. And, um, and it did come in, uh, and there's the table. Or Barking Town Square, you know, an attempt to make a new public space for the best and worst of days, and to give um, dignity, mystery, and um, an open-endedness of meaning beyond the sort of the, no, the fantasy of, a, of cheerfulness and um, umbrellas. This is our new publication, which is always in a state of unreadiness. <laughs> um, and so, but it's live, so you can, you can buy chapters. Um, it's a collaboration with uh, Helen Thomas, and we'd recommend you just wait like two weeks, because it's just, we've got to just get one of the introduction in there, but um, there's a discounted rate till March. So hope you all buy one. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to tag team. Um, we just wanted to thank Lynn 
and Elizabeth and the rest of the team for the invitation to come and present on this panel. It's extraordinary to be here with two practices that we have admired so much. It's a great honour. And, and parlour is different to the, is. the two practices that have been described so far. So I think, you know, and I guess the most obvious difference is that we don't practise architecture, <laughs> but we um, do like to think that we practise on architecture in the uh, more old fashioned uh, use of the term to deceive. Um, so parlour was, you know, we come out of a specific context. We were founded in 2012 as an online advocacy and plat uh, publishing platform that was part of a much larger um, university-based research project into women in architecture. Again, I think uh, because we were all going well, so what happened? We thought it would all be dealt with by now, and it's not. Um, in 2015, we then became a formal non-profit organisation, again advocating um, for gender equity in architecture. And I think our particular context that's given us the kind of um, opportunities that we've found is really the online and social media environment. And they've been absolutely fundamental to building and mobilising a very active and diverse community that's not bound by geography and that's connected to a growing wave of feminist activism and architecture across the world. Dr Burns. Thank you. Um, so. This, this operation within a digital environment that doesn't have geographical boundaries is one f feature that's remarked on to define fourth wave um, feminism. Another key feature of this phenomenon is data, whether it's big data, small data, institutional data, data that we've skived away from our slightly dodgy online surveys. <laughs> anyway, we data don't, activism. We don't do dodgy data. <laughs> Don't listen to her. Yeah. <laughs> so at Parlour, one of our members, Jill Matheson's statistical analysis of architecture's gender gap has been crucial. But also the visualisation of the data, which feeds into um, a contemporary sensibility about the presence of data, data analytics in our everyday life. But this visualisation of the shock findings of architecture's gender gap has galvanised and persuaded many including gender sceptics, for you might not believe this, but there are people who actually don't think that architecture has a gender problem. Not anymore. We've met them. We've transformed them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So, um, we are also like to think of ourselves as a collective and participatory project, um, quite different to Matrix and Muff, but we would still see ourselves in those terms. We operate in the space between research and action and between scholarly and practice-based knowledge. We've worked very hard to embed questions and issues of gender equity at the centre of discussions about the future of the profession. Um, we ran an event some years ago called Transform, Altering the Future of Architecture, where we asked if architecture was more inclusive, would it also be in a stronger position? And of course, we think the answer is yes. So rather than um, locating conversations about gender to the margins of the profession, um, we would want to claim that these questions are fundamental to, to transforming architectural practice in the mainstream as well. So, like good 1970s feminists, we provide DIY tools for change. I wanted, yeah, I know, I always <laughs> say it the wrong way. I wanted them to have this very retro macrame. macrame feel, but we've gone for high quality design by Catherine Griffiths. Um, the 10 parlour guides for equitable practice encourage institutions, employers, and employees to attend to the work and labour practices of architecture. The guides provide concrete, tangible information on a range of issues from pay to flexible work. They are written in user-friendly language and demonstrate the different forms of agency and roles available for changing the labour practices of our profession. 
So, look, we do lots and lots of things, um, and this is just a sort of small snippet. But one of the um, things that we try to do with through the statistics, but also um, through rather more kind of these are these other tools is to reveal the complexity that's already within the profession and the practice, um, the personnel and the practice of architecture. But there's really very rarely visible at all in the either the public um, image of the profession or indeed the the um, image that the profession has of itself. Um, so we we really are a platform. We try and provide a, a, a quite a wide range of spaces to speak, which is a play on the name Parlour, which Dr. Burns came up with. Um, so we've been running these things called seasonal salons, which are really just a kind of conversation between two women at different stages of their careers, and they're quite informal and intimate. Um, we have guest Instagram hosting every week. We have a different host, um, and uh, we would really love it if any of you were interested in doing that. <laughs> and these, neither of those things are um, very heavily briefed. In fact, they're really underbriefed. It's just, here's a platform, what would you do with it? And as an editor, that's quite confronting. Um, but it's good. We've got a Marion's List, which is this online register of women in the built environment, and that's really the first time we're explicitly saying we're, it's not just women in architecture, it's women in the built environment. But, so every time we make a complaint about something, for example, the all-male panel, which, you know, I'm quite good at complaining about that, um, we try to also offer a kind of way forward. So we can complain about the all-male panel because we can point people to Marion's List because, quite frankly, I got really sick of people ringing me up and going, oh, we need a woman, and she said, no, and who else can we have? Um, so I, so we, I guess we're always trying to find um, these various tools and opportunities that other people can get on board and help make change. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to provide the profession with evidence of its own diversity and the means to activate that diversity. That's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, everyone. And um, I, I think I think um, we'll just, given the hour, open it up to the floor. Uh, please um, uh, uh, put your hand up and have have your questions ready. Or like a Quaker meeting. Anything that. <laughs> Unshaken but not stirred. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is uh, even relevant, but um, before I ask my question, mm -hmm. it's such an honour to be in the same room as all of you and all of you um, as a young female architect. Um, who is Marion? Oh, Marion. Marion is Marion Marnie Griffin, who was um, Walter Burley Griffin's um, partner in business and life, um, designer of Canberra, the capital of Australia, um, very influential in Frank Lloyd Wright's studio. Um, Karen can tell you a lot more about Marion. She also wore a silk something or other very nicely. Um, she, was, she came out of Chicago, which is a really important town for radical social thinking around urbanism and by no coincidence it's Obama's hometown as well. Mm -hmm. It's this amazing history of urban organising and so she, they were, she was connected into social movements and feminism and then in 1911 she and Walter Burley Griffin won the international competition to design the new federal capital of Australia and they designed it in a really interesting way based on an American model of participatory democracy. So the building at the, at the centre of the top of Capitol Hill was a people's space where, where there was a space for people to speak and citizens to engage in the democratic process. So we wanted to brand this idea of a digital register of women in the built environment with a particular name. And for all of those reasons, it made sense. Marion was very connected into the uh, suffragette movement in Chicago and then she, when she moved to Melbourne she was able to maintain those connections and connect into local suffragette organising. She and Walter were against the First World War. So they were unusual in Australian architecture, which was terribly conservative, that they were radical social organisers and they had this idea of participatory democracy in this space to speak. So we named the list 
after her, even though she's not an Australian, we, mm -hmm. as we do, we adopted her, and like we do with New Zealanders, and we claim them as our own. <laughs> but, and the other thing is, for a long time, it, she was this remarkable drawer, and for a long time, the, there was a sort of assumption that she'd just done the drafting, and it was all really Walter's idea. So we're also, um, I suppose, there's a, a large effort to reclaim her as well. So and to put the idea of the partnership, yeah. which can't necessarily be disentangled, you know, at the centre of that model, but that's a good question. So we name everything. We spend quite a lot of time debating about what the names of things Karen names it. should be <laughs> to, because it's part of the intellectual branding of the projects, um, and this has been really important. So I think in Australia, Marion is pretty, it, it's a pretty recognisable name straight away that people that, you know, not actually not everyone knows, but we assumed it's a thing. It's also, you know, it relates to Emily's list, the sort of, uh, so it's a kind of... Would you, would you two have been able to make what without bronze? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but Matrix, I mean, it could, uh, because tomorrow there's some young, uh, young next generation, there's, um, I know Alvin speaking, and uh, there are other fledgling organisations in London like I did, but they make, they kind of, they work, they work all day and attempt to make the work in the weekend. And I just wondered, do you think Matrix could have made the work without the grants? So all of it was public funded. Yeah. Um, but they weren't, it wasn't, I mean, grants, the clients, but like you're the one of the women's committee. The so the technical the aid, there was there was about forty thousand, which is quite a lot then uh, a year for technical aid. A lot of money. <laughs> uh, uh, there was about uh, it. It was, I think it was, it was it was less than half of the income of the practice. So the rest of the practice was getting money, but it was all public funded, mm -hmm. and so other people were making grant applications for their buildings. Uh, to do that too, and and actually, it's very true to say that, or, or some of it was just regular housing housing corporation stuff, housing association stuff like like the stuff you've done. Um, so yeah, probably sixty percent or so of the work wasn't directly grant funded. Uh, 40% was. And 40% was, yeah. was only for a period though. A couple of years. I'm not. I'm not attacking. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> Isn't it more that? Yeah. You we should have could it now. be shouting for it. We and should I think, have them now. You know, in a way, this little exchange is an example about the way that women are not supporting each other to kind of think about, like, moving forward, speaking loudly for what's needed, and um, the way that, say, if we think about the GLA housing design guidance, although they enshrine some things, mm. they, you know, that there is very little work being done about the interior of domestic space at the moment, for example. Um, but Liza, you seem, or Muff seems very good at getting public funding for your projects? I mean, from local authorities? The projects that we show yeah. are, um, they're, 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 they're projects where the funding comes from commercial development. Mm -hmm. These are 106s, these are the deals with the devil, these are, um, cross-subsidised by us, effectively, <laughs> by the little we um, earn, because it's the assumption in the fees that are competitively established that they're going to be done in a fast and dirty way. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, I, th I do think the money's incredibly important, and I think it was a moment in London because of the GLC, because of Ken Livingstone, because of the Women's Committee, where funding was there, mm -hmm. and there were technical aid centres and all that. So. And, and I think the sort of funding sources now are quite different. I think the possibilities of crowdfunding are actually rather wonderful. Time consuming. And time consuming. Yeah. Well, actually, applying for grants was also very <laughs> time consuming. It wasn't just they said, oh, give you the money. You had to, you know, it was a competitive process. And, and we certainly spent. And, but, but I was going to say, I think that part of that was um, that there were real activist networks. And again, you know, you have to think of a world with no social media. So how those activist networks mm. communicated and um, how that kind of got spread. But I think that those sorts of opportunities, so I do think the money, I think it's really key, the money. But I think the thing that was fantastically strong, which Julia showed really, really well, is 
it just expanded into all these different things because that was possible. There was a kind of there was a whole set of different activist movements that did did collaborate, and so you had a kind of energy that you could build up. But since this is being recorded, it is true that we have managed to argue for the kind of extra episode making the bid to the Museum of London to do a public archaeological dig for Al Tab Ali. So that when the brief isn't sufficient to in some way reflect the situation you're in, then finding the ways and means to um, enrich it. Hmm. I think we're also in a moment of resurgent social activism across a whole series of domains and we have um, different ways of organising people now, which are non-physical, yeah. and that that you know is that has positives and negatives as well. But it does really enable these transnational connections. And if you think about the campaign around the Pritzker Prize for Denise Scott Brown, you know it's an extraordinary instance of a global feminist campaign in architecture. And, and I'd really like to hear from the audience. Everyone's getting tired, but you know, to, <laughs> but just you know, here's this body of however many years it is, 40, 30, 30, more than three decades. And um, yeah, I just think any, any responses? Be... So I actually had a, a question that was brewing before you invited that, Liza, but um, thank you very much. Um, I am picking up the question of the public and the question for today that you raised, Liza, in relation to the 19, late 1970s, when public is, you know, what is it now? And I suppose it was more thinking about the reflection of names. We've got Marion, we've got Ethel, we've got this reclaiming and very, very careful thinking that Parler have, have exemplified. And yet we've got absolute facelessness and um, in terms of the public and the, um, uh, you know, the patrons um, is, is not the right term, but the, the, the responsibility. Where is the responsibility? And how do we navigate that in a world where we're actually taking a lot of responsibility as making the built environment um, and actually being very, um, uh, you know, very sort of open about that? And yet we're meeting developers, um, uh, you know, kind of agencies in all the sort of space of global capital that evades that constantly. I just would be interested in some comment on that. Um, you know, tiny little, uh, you know, you could call them tiny gestures, so, um, you know, uh, wait to the, to the time constraints. We've just finished a project at East Croydon, a corporate landscape where um, we make, you know, our pitiful little, you know, there are both formally making um, outside rooms, making explicit the presence of children with the just so simply tiny, tiny little benches. Um, and uh, overtly in terms of the uh, degree of, um, of a lack of control of uh, a water um, you know, fountain to have free water. You know, these are tiny little gestures and each one is a, a fight and an argument for it. And I, it's not heroic. I mean, Muff, Muff were invited to Vienna as a keynote speaker um, a, a, a really good conference called um, Crisis or Critique and it was like don't make it look fun don't make it look creative Liza, this, this designing your way out of these limitations because we're almost in that rubbish place that London's in and so I, I you know, framed the talk as the ghost of Christmas future um, that if you think of the energy one puts in to make the space more public if you were put, able to put that energy into the making of the space, how good that would be. So I, I think it's, it is contingent on us all to, to be political. Um, and, and it's exciting, you know, this moment in London, Sadiq has said, we want good growth. You know, what does that mean to have development tempered with experience? And, uh, you know, myself, my rep here, as Mayor's Design Advocates, kind of what can we do to argue the case? for the non-monetarised you know, value system. I think one um, of the things that Pala does is um, we can test the public realm of mm -hmm. architecture. So this is the realm in which representations circulate of the profession and its goals and its membership. And, and we know that that image 
has been complicit with austerity and you know, liberalism um, and design for the 1%. And Parla shows us the kind of everyday life of many, many women architects who do fine work. Um, there's a big tradition in Australia still of public realm work, of commitment to civic architecture, small scale practices, domestic practices. And it's about contesting um, the dominant image that's handed down to us, the idealisation of star architecture, when the reality is that most people's lives and practices in their professional careers are very different and contribute something really different. So it's very humble, but it's kind of, in a way, in its own gentle ways, taking on that, that giant of representation. I mean, when you said it just kind of grew and grew and grew, that's exactly what happened to us. I mean, we set up a website for a research project and it kind of went feral on us, um, which is, you know, a great thing. But um, and I can't even remember where I was going with that. <laughs> I'm terribly jet-lagged. Um, really, my mind's gone blank. I'm very sorry. Oh, can, can I, can I, I sorry, can I just step in? We have the a audience question will fill in for you. Make notes. I'm sure you will remember. Yeah. I, I, will, I will make my, uh, my comment, if I may. Uh, I have to say first that I am absolutely delighted to see the culture of architecture that is happening here. You know, I, I, I feel that I can be a little bit more at ease uh, with this panel. I, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. I have to make a comment, though, um, from what Lisa just said about the humble, the humble act uh, that one can you know, fight for. And you mentioned, you mentioned children and you, you, you mentioned uh, water fountains um, to, to, to be present in public space. But the thing is that we are in a very difficult position at the moment where these little humble acts have been co opted also for co by corporations. And, and, and you know, Granary Square is just the main uh, example of this, by which the image of children in masses during the summer playing with the fountains, with the water, uh, legitimizes the privatization of public space. So um, my, my, my question and my comment is, um, how do you think that we could enter into a process of negotiation that doesn't necessarily have to come from uh, upfront uh, <coughs> confrontation uh, with these processes of privatization uh, through little humble acts? But what, what do you think that could be done beyond that to interfere in a space and in a public realm which is already done and delivered through architectural design? Well, come to Granary, uh, so Mel here sitting I, here. I know, yes. Um, <laughs> so look forward to seeing you um, making some efforts there. Um, well, we'll uh, I, am, I, am, later. I, I am actually doing a research project okay, exactly so on that. <laughs> when you take over their Instagram to demonstrate how you Absolutely. manage to yeah. interfere with it. Right. As far as, I mean, the acts of co-option, you know, if we look at art practice, it happens continuously yeah. and faster and faster and faster. Um, I really loathe Granary Square, but I almost think, you know, if you look at it in winter and how pathetic mm -hmm. it is, these little kind of tragic little tiny yes. fountains, at least that moment when it's taken over by <coughs> 200 crazed children who do live over the road in the estate, at least they're taking it over. And we can think of other places where because of context, um, what's going on in housing, that they are sitting, those fountains would be in isolation and there wouldn't be anyone living next door. And in a way that's the battle is to protect um, mixed tenure housing in the centre of the city so that there are some children to take over the, um, the gestures, you know, the, co the corporate space. And in a sense, that is the slide of the creches, you know, in the director's office, is if we can, um, through planning or through um, influence or through being mm. in the room to make the argument that we make the adjacencies that pleasures can be stolen. And I think that that's where it's spatial at the scale of the city is, is, to, make, is to make those adjacencies. Yeah, I think we have to expand our practice beyond 
spatial design. It's actually got to be about policy, lobbying, um, belonging to particular political parties. Like, it, it can't be that idea that somehow the intervention is only going to happen through a design intervention and then you fight out this battle in design terms. It's exactly what you're saying. You've got to be in the room. You've got to be doing boring things which are incredibly important, like changing policy. But, I, I mean, I... I think what's really interesting, because I, I think you do all those, you know, what yeah, we, all we've all talked about and we all agree, and it's uh, why we get on so well is we all think, just try all these things, really, <laughs> because, of the, because of the problem of co-option. So it's always yeah. going to happen, and it's always yeah. three steps forward and two steps back, and that's just the nature of the beast, and it's fine. Um, I think, I mean, what's interesting for me in what I feel is a change in how I've come to understand what I do from the early days of Matrix is seeing how important it is to really... I think Matrix was very interested in changing processes. So I think we were always doing that. We were always getting asked, you know, what does a feminist architecture look like? It's like, actually, we don't care. That isn't the point. Yes. Uh, but it would be the perpetual question. And I think, for me, it's that thing about um, everyday practices, about everyday social and spatial practices, which, again, is, it's a common shift, you know, that people are thinking more in that way. But for me, those are, you know, the way that that Muff and Lisa talk about that. It's talking about it as a practice, not as a designed thing. And if we look at them as designed things, all we'll see is the image being co-opted. Mm. And it's not the image, even though that's what we do. As anybody in the built environment is, we're obsessed with the something about the representation of form. But actually, really, what we should be obsessed by are the everyday practices and all the processes above that, in terms of how architecture and the built, other built environment professions work and how we can intrude, you know, I'm repeating what Karen says, how we can intrude in different ways. And I think it is often, it is small things, but it is also events. It is also, it's a kind of, it's, it's an action. It's a set of actions. It's not about the things. In the end, it's never yeah. about the things. So I'm going to have a call out here for Alison, who's not here because her baby is, is so energised. But... Um, is, but it, it can be about things because you can make things that are sort of too hard to reproduce. So in the case of the folly embarking, because it was made by hand in a situation where everything was designed built, it is difficult to co-opt it because it's crumbly, it's made <coughs> out of many different pieces, it's made by hand. And so in doing so, it's difficult to take that away, like to take away those, that embodied um, experience. And I think that that is something that we're trying to do more and more in the wedging open the door. Um, Catherine's big uh, practice at the moment is working with the Readiness for Work organisation and just making ways that mainly young men have um, experiences that can't be taken away from them in the act of making. So um, I suppose there, you know, there are other modes of, of thinking formally of, of what's made, like the spaces that are made and how they're made, and perhaps bringing in uh, a durational approach of how long they take to make yeah. them that keeps you in the room. I also think social change takes a long time, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to be committed to it long term. And that means you have to wear the periods where the forces of evil take over and you, you've got to have tactics for survival as well. And you have to be committed to long-term change. But also none of us are working in, any kind, in some kind of pure environment where, you know, we're all kind of free of compromise and contingency. And, you know, we all... And different people have different skills and different abilities to work in different contexts. And so one of the... You know, in Australia, so many people I know are going will, you know, practice as, as, as one option, but going into government, going, you know, client side, as they call it, because they see a, an opportunity to affect change in different kinds of ways. And I think one of the things we've been trying to do is to say all of this is a kind of mode of practice and that, you know, the very conventional institutionalised idea of what an architect is, is is incredibly narrow. And obviously you guys are... Um, you know, really challenging that, but there are other probably less overtly visible ways to challenge that too. And I mean, the biggest reaction we got when we when we launched was, oh, it's not just me. And I think just building that sense of, 
of collective identity through lots of very different ways of operating is, is quite important. I, um, I also want to thank you all for being here. It's fantastic to have you all in the room together. And I think one of the things just listening to you made me think about were scales of engagement and thinking about the micro and the macro. And because some of you have a longer time frame to think about your impact of work, some are much more recent. I'm curious how you think about scales of engagement and whether through time it's become something you think about as having a far ranging impact versus dealing with the the day-to-day -day, want to make change and thinking about the problem, problemizing the profession at the, at the moment that you're working versus a kind of longer trajectory. And if, if that longer trajectory is more because you've, you've had time to think about it versus, you know, when I found the parlor site a few years ago and it was exactly that reaction of, oh my God, there's someone around the world who is actually thinking about the same things I am. Like what kind of scales of impact do you hope to have versus that you know you're working at on a daily basis? Because I think those are different ways that we operate or potentially can operate. No, I'm, no, I'm just did fiddling, don't worry. Um, so uh, I've been involved in teaching for a long time now and the kind of practice that I've been doing has mutated into working collaboratively with um, either other architects in taking place and academics uh, or with artists and so the, the so I was just thinking about where public is and there's Granary Square but uh, and there's CSM <laughs> uh, but 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 and that's that CSM just for example which is next to Granary Square is also a place where public things happen and where I teach also for me is an extension of the public realm actually because the students are although yes the universities are now semi competitive organizations and they're run by councils they're still uh, very much within operating within a government unlike this place uh, within a government um, context and the students that we have a large proportion are for example first generation university first generation british blah 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 um, so it's commonly the case uh, in many of the um, architecture schools in the UK. And so for me, the, the, the place of public is actually in my teaching practice partly and in how I think about what I say, how I, what I do in that place, both in, uh, in the studio and in uh, talking about professional practice, for example, and ways in which one might question practice. Um, yeah, so, and then working collaboratively in a very small way, not necessarily making work, sometimes making work. We, taking place, did some work in a perinatal unit in a hospital in Hackney. And they're very small, they're very uh, collaborative and also very, uh, very much arising from discussions with the communities around that unit. Uh, that, that's where, for me, it's happening. And I think of those places as public. I'm, I'm not engaged in private work for domestic, you know, in domestic spaces, private individual, individuals very much. I have done it, but um, mm -hmm. I've got to say. But uh, generally, I think the place of teaching in uh, state universities, if you like, is a sort of an extension of the public. Could we have maybe one more question? Can I, can I ask oh, oh, well, Larry, that's not it because that's oh. a good question. So, <laughs> mm. just like really going on celebrating Helen's place here, but the the dot, the, um, the so-called book I described is actually this online one, and it's about um, it will have everybody. It has almost everybody's ever worked a month, and it's built. The dotted names are collaborators. Mm. Both Helen's in there. And uh, Mel could find herself, maybe, or Sarah <laughs> could find herself. And then, you know, you click, and if it's a good, but it, it, then you get um, the website of that person. And um, probably not that person, but that person, let's see. There, there's Alison. Um, and so, you know, this is the recognition that Muff isn't, doesn't make money because we spend any extra goes back into the unpaid part of the project 
So although we're very proud that we offer greater than the minimum maternity benefits and we offer flexible working, we can't offer a succession. You know, all we can offer is this extremely hard time, you know, but a, hard, a hard set of experiences. But what is joyful is that when we look at that, there's a lot of practices. There's um, people like Sophie Handler who, or Nishat Anwar, whose work in the office, that unsolicited extra work, became developed as PhDs and they formed careers. And I think, I don't know if any of you want to have a word. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say exactly the same thing in response to that question, which was the same thing that was coming into my head about impact and legacy, partly because it's about a different set of frameworks that might... Um, give off into the world different sorts of references and influence. And maybe Liza said it in respect to Muff, which I was thinking of the diagram as well, that many people move through a practice that happens in every sort of professional practice. But I do think the difference with the practices maybe in front are a different sort of legacy that is um, uh, quite um, sort of I guess, uh, seismic in terms of a, a, a influence, but also freeing and, let's say, generous in what it might take you on to. That's certainly my experience. And I, I just, maybe, maybe each could answer that, but I think if you think about normal forms of practice and the competitiveness of, the jo of jobs in the profession, how do the table think that their, pra their sort of forms of practice give a different sort of legacy that might change? Or is it influential? Because ultimately this issue of what's influential is really important mm. for things to change. I was just going to say in response to Laurie, I mean, one of the things that keeps me going is the sense that I'm part of a tradition. Like, and that's why feminist history and the history of action, left action and feminist action is so important because when I'm overwhelmed by the prospect of change, I know that I'm part of a much longer term social movement. But I think one of the things that Parla has done around that sense of scale and agency is that it redistributes the instruments of agency. So a lot of what happens is that um, ideas and tangible ideas for change are then distributed across various people in the profession who then go on and take them on in, in all sorts of ways. So instead of just this small organisation doing it on their own, it's, it's really about that collective action. Perhaps that's, and that, perhaps that's the answer for you, yeah. is if the multiple humble acts yeah. come together, they can make their own little landslide. And, yeah. and, it, and also what's nice is you get paid. So that's actually also my boss. Oh. So Mel does the, the unemployable. She, she employs me. <laughs> <laughs> I, do a little bit, I do a seminar at CSM, so I think that there is these, the, this give and take and the recognition of the huge investment people make in offices, but that actually, um, in order to make, make this work and make your work, and, and yet how it, you know, one act nurtures the other. And so if you go to the theory of gift exchange, yeah. the gift that's held on to becomes a curse, but once it's handed on, it, it sort of builds. I think, I think that's very distinctive. I mean, my experience of that is it's, it's highly distinctive as a sort of practice and profession that's different. It's not, well, it's often uh, the competitiveness or privilege of other forms of professional practice, architectural practice, are totally different. And that that should be, uh, I guess, more foregrounded or understood because it's the, a sort of um, a, a really influential yet small scale. I just wanted to ask you something, because I kind of, I, it's a really, really informative point, it's really good, but I was also thinking the thing is, I, what's brilliant about some of the things we're talking about is it is informal women's networks, and that we're with it, one of the things, you know, we've talked often about spreading beyond the profession and not just being within architecture, but the truth is, this, you know, and, and it happened with Matrix too, that things, you make contacts, you make networks, uh, and and those are strong women's networks. And I suppose I would think the only difference is that traditional practice within architecture is a gentleman's club. And there's loads of male networks and they support each other and they give each other work. And you know, if I look at my Facebook feed, the men are always saying really nice things about other men, but they never say anything nice about a woman. Maybe the people that are on my Facebook feed. <laughs> I can tell you who they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go and interfere with your 
Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Oh, no, sorry, do you want I to just. Say I just wanted to yeah. say in response to that like, that the thing that Parla does that I think is interesting that you all do as well is we don't hoard information. It's really about information sharing and that old idea that that's how you empower people. Knowledge is power. So you put put the tools together for them give them the toolkit, they go into the world and they do it and it multiplies. And I mean, I... Wait, just just a minute. What I wanted to say is I just think that, well, today we talked about many different sort of topics and one of them was care and looking at how women traditionally, like, things that they're known for is care, but then Mm -hmm. how that's devalued. And what I like about, well, I worked at MUFF and I'm still involved in MUF, and I have mentoring from MUF, not to be gushy, but, <laughs> I, but, but I, I think that's really important that women don't, in a way, overly masculate, the, like the masculinity sort of, to become sort of the, the idealized version of a man, where it's like, I'm going to be tough, I'm not going to, I'm going to like be super masculine in order to make it in a man-made environment, but to value what actually women are and what we biologically are sort of like, I would like to say programmed to do and, and give that value and just like showcase that and say, yeah, we do care about each other and we can build networks. And if we help each other, then eventually, you know, we could be on a level playing field and then just value that in, in, in general. Will you describe your course that you, your course you set up there? Oh my, well, yeah. my little architecture summer school. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to make this all about me, but yeah. Um, well, uh, from someone who comes from, as a woman, but another thing that hasn't been discussed is a woman of colour. Okay. I, I feel that architecture is not very, as we all know, diverse. Mm. Not, not in just in terms of sex, but in terms of race and class and economic background. Mm. So what I was interested in once I finished my architecture summer school, well, my architecture education was to set up a summer school for teenagers and young people to get them to sort of think about design as a, as a, something that they can go into that they probably never heard about. So I, I, I in myself, wanted to build a network and then make use of the network that I had built with, like, and the network that Liza and I have together, you know, with, and people at MUFF and just further that and be more generous in, in terms of like what, who, could, who could actually see architecture as a viable career. No, thank you very much for that. And on that note of legacy and change, I think it's a very good time to thank our panel. Oh, we're already out of time. Our keynoters. <laughs> And to thank the audience for their participation and questions. And we could obviously go on a lot longer, but we have to stop sometime. And I think it's now's a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you.